You okay? <laughs> well, to quote Taylor Swift, uh, welcome to New York. Uh, delighted to have so many of you joining us here today. And this takes me back to a major speech I gave just a few months ago at the Vatican. And I was delighted by the fact that when our Pope, and I'm Catholic, our Pope prioritizes what we have to talk about and how we have to lift up the people of this earth, that he wanted to focus on climate change. So I went to Rome and had a chance to represent this alliance there, and I was so proud to do that. And we had some of our members, Gavin Newsom and Maura Healy, uh, Governor Gail Newsom from California, Maura Healy from Massachusetts, joined me as well. But I reflected for a long time on the words of Pope Francis and what he said. He reminded us that our moral responsibility extends beyond borders, it extends beyond politics, that we must safeguard our natural environment, but also our most vulnerable communities, the ones most endangered by climate change. I take that seriously, as do my colleagues who are here today, and I'm so proud to be joined by climate champion, someone like Jay Inslee, who has put this issue on the map and been talking about long before others saw the detrimental effects of climate change. He was whistling in the wind for a long time, but as leaders like that that brought us to where we are today where you have Pope Francis, national leaders, state leaders, and the rest of the country talking about climate change. Not as something that's a fearful uh, specter that could happen in the future. It is happening right now. And I want to give him a round of applause. This may be your last official climate week as, as a governor, but stay with us. Stay with us on these issues. My co-chair of the alliance, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, who brings that energy and that excitement and also representing a state that sees its position as well. It's, it's not just the larger populated states. It's every state has a responsibility to find new ways to power the technologies and the homes and the business of their states. And I want to thank her for being a great champion on behalf of all the other governors of the alliance. Let's give a round of applause to Michelle Lujan Grisham, our governor of New Mexico. Casey, yes, thanks for bringing the, uh, the bottled up energy, the excitement that this week uh, calls for. And I want to thank you for your leadership, not just this week, but throughout every day of the year. And uh, having uh, Ali Zaidi once again uh, representing the White House, which has been an amazing partner. As you know, the genesis of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and Jay knows this because he was there, he's one of the early founders, was when Donald Trump, as president, walked away from the Paris Agreement that we are all supposed to adhere to. All the countries who signed on to this were committed to achieving goals and taking their own nations collectively forward, uh, join with others. When he basically tore that up and threw it out the, you know, in the garbage, we decided as states, um, and those who came before me decided that more can be done together. And so it is such, it's been so refreshing uh, for the last three and a half years to have the Biden administration, represented by Ellie, the, 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 the Biden-Harris administration, that we don't have to fight against, but we are strong allies together. So let's give a round of applause to him as well. <laughs> my, inter my dream team is here representing all my agencies. I thank them for all they do. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to take notice. Uh, this is the first time we've had two women leading the U.S. Climate Alliance. Alliance uh, <laughs> You want it done right, you put some women in charge, right, Michelle? That's okay. We're good. And so, you know, no offense. We just we're just building on your work and taking it up. That's all. Uh, but as as you know, it's half of the nation is represented. Now, my question is, where's the other half? Uh, that's for each state leader to decide. But why isn't this a 50-state coalition? I have to pose that question. But we do represent 60% of the country's economy, which is nothing small to uh, laugh about. It is very significant. So what we do here as part of this alliance has an impact beyond our own individual state borders. And, you know, we know what's happening. There's always been this tension now since, you know, the Industrial Revolution, which created great industries and propelled our economy forward. But the pollution that was created to fuel that is something that I know personally as someone who grew up next to a steel plant. And I thought as a child that the sky was naturally orange because that's the color it was on the shores of one of the, the great freshwater lakes in the world, Lake Erie, that every night you could see molten lava being discharged into because that's how the Bethlehem Steel operated. Nobody questioned it. 
It was 20,000 jobs. The economy was growing. No one thought anything about what was happening there until about the late 1960s and 70s. We started seeing the health effects, and uh, the rest is history. Finally, finally woke up to what to mankind's assault on Mother Nature. It was profound. So that is steeped in me deeply as a climate uh, advocate, a, a huge champion because of my own childhood. But as economies grow, in our country at least, the, the planet grew sicker. And as a result, we're dealing with the effects right now. And I also look at what are the effects. I've been governor three years. I have had more natural disasters in my state than you can combine decades before. I had two hurricanes my first week on the job, more than Florida had that year. I have had the deadliest blizzards. My hometown of Buffalo, 42 people dead in a blizzard. Seven feet of snow came down, record. The heaviest flooding just came back from Long Island a couple weeks ago surveying the effects of a thousand year flooding event. And that was my second thousand year flooding event. I don't think there's thousand year events anymore. Uh, we had record tornadoes. We had more tornadoes in July in New York than all of the states that are comprised of Tornado Alley combined. So something is happening. The hottest temperatures, the coldest temperatures. So you'd have to be in a coma not to recognize that there is a profound shift in what is going on here. And I have to deal with that. I mean, the costs are enormous. The communities are suffering. People are, lose their homes, their livelihoods. So we have to find this balance between growing our economies and the energy that's required to support that, create thousands of jobs, which is so important, but also what are the effects? And we can no longer turn a blind eye to that. And that's what we're talking about here today, because here in New York, we're welcoming the growth of AI. We're gonna have the nation's largest semi-computer de dedicated to responsible AI to solve society's problems. That's what I wanna use it for, to harness it for good. We have the largest semiconductor manufacturing facility being built in America. 50,000 new jobs are coming to upstate New York. That's something we're very proud of. But as we have more fab chips and all these facilities, at the same time, we want to reduce our carbon emissions to save the planet. So they seem like they're in conflict, and they are a challenge. But we're already hard at work at solving those problems. We have hydroelectric power from Canada, I just met the Canadian Prime Minister last night, we talked about our, our joint work on the Champlain-Hudson line, bringing power from Quebec down, hydropower to power 20% of New York City's power needs. That's extraordinary, we made that decision my first week on the job, we need to move forward with this. So we're investing in the clean energy technologies, advanced manufacturing, um, building all the resiliency we can to prepare for this. And we're really, really proud of our offshore wind uh, achievements. I literally just met, left a company that's looking at our state uh, for being involved in com building component parts. But this year we, com we completed the nation's first utility grade offshore wind farm in the country. I mean, that's, that's significant. And that's going to power over 600,000 homes. And we're constructing more ports to accommodate this. But the point is I want to turn these investments into jobs. That's why we're here with our friends in labor. Let me give a shout out to the people of labor, the men and women who have had to transition from traditional jobs and be acclimated to this whole new world of opportunity. Sometimes change is hard, but our relationships with labor is so strong. It's so strong and powerful. They see their role in the clean energy future, and that's what I'm embracing here today. That's what we're talking about here today. So this gives us thousands of opportunities. On behalf of <clears throat> sorry, occupational hazard is you lose your voice when you give too many speeches, and this which is only Monday. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm announcing $2.3 million just from New York to have support careers in offshore wind, and we have an already an offshore wind training institute on Long Island. IBEW Local 3 will train more than 500 New Yorkers for careers in offshore wind. That's how we're going to continue moving this industry forward. And they'll understand how to safely operate hundreds of feet above the waves, how to build these in, this infrastructure <clears throat> and power our lights and charge our phones. And also, that's just New York. Let's talk what we're doing nationally through this alliance. We are all engaged in this work. Every state is involved in this. They see the opportunities, but also the help we have from the federal government, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and the Chips and Science Act. 
our partners in the Biden-Harris administration have unleashed this massive wave of opportunity, and we're all seizing it. We believe that combined, these combined investments will lead to over 3 million good-paying jobs already in the climate field. 70 percent, this is what's important, 70 percent will be available to people without a college degree. This is unprecedented, this moment in time. You can, we're not talking about some transition happening in the future. We're talking about unfolding right now. And that's what we're so excited about, and opening the doors to underrepresented communities. And I go to these job sites all the time, and I want to see more women and people of color, and the unions recognize this. That's where they're doing their recruiting, because these industries have been previously closed off to them. But also, the skills we need. I, can, I just talked to someone now who told me if they come here, they're going to need 1,000 jobs. And I said, sure, that's not a problem. OK, now I have to figure that out. Uh, and we will, and we will. That's how you combine ambition and objectives that are so important together, and that's what this is all about. So we're launching here the Governor's Climate Ready Workforce Initiative. Thank you, Governors, for supporting this as well. <clears throat> and this initiative, our working together, will create over 1 million registered apprentices in climate-ready fields by the year 2035, which is right around the corner. And this is a model. We've used this model before, just like we have in construction and manufacturing. You train people in the skills, you give them hands-on experience, you point the way, you show them a path forward, and they are part of the economy that's so important, but at the same time, they're lifting up their own families and increasing their income. So we need them to build solar panels uh, to soak up the power of the sun. I need them to help raise the wind turbines in the ocean safeguard our shorelines from build more resiliency. We need them there. So we can't do it alone. Uh, this is why a national effort sharing best practices, working with our educational institution and community organizations will help do us. So that's what today's announcement is. We're, we're committed to this. We believe this is the missing link that if we are intentional, put money behind it, and work together as 24 states, there is no stopping us. And so I thank everyone for being part of this, and there's no limit to what we're going to do together, because we are the first generation to truly see the effects of climate change. We've talked about it for years. We are the ones, and we have to protect it for the young people coming behind us. We do not want them to ever question, as I did when I was growing up in Buffalo, in Lackawanna, saying, how did you let this happen? We are the ones who are saying, we will not let it happen. It stops right now. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, let's give it up one more time for Governor Hochul. So next up is her fellow co-chair of the Alliance. And she already sort of stole the, the thunder here. but. Um, I just want to say how proud we are for the Alliance to be led by two women governors for the first time in our coalition's history. Like Governor Hochul, this governor is leading by example today and announcing new action in her state to kickstart this critical work. She's also traversed the globe representing our coalition, going as far as Egypt and Dubai to deliver the message of state-led climate action to our international partners abroad. We're so grateful for her leadership, and we're so grateful to have her here today in New York, Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. Yet again, they made a podium for Jay Ensley, but not for Michelle Lujan Grisham. Uh, it is an incredible honor uh, to participate directly with uh, my co-chair. And I agree, Kathy, with you uh, universally that we, uh, I do it literally, look up to uh, Jay Ensley for his work uh, in, in the climate space. And I think we can all agree that until this administration and their work on getting significant incentives and invest investments over the finish line, uh, we had great ideas, but the movement of those ideas, not just to tackle climate change, but to provide the kind of resilience, that's job growth and opportunities for states, uh, wasn't moving as fast as both we want it for our growing economies and also to tackle the issues that we've committed ourselves to. And I think we should do that one more time 
Uh, Governor Ensley in 2018 actually came to some of our uh, community college labs where they were already engaging in the best practices, new ideas, and training a future workforce. And I have no doubt that that helped me get elected uh, in 2019. So Governor Ensley, thank you for your leadership. All right, so you know the announcement, right? We want states to be the ground, uh, ground zero, I shouldn't say that, um, but it's meaningful. You have a moment in time where we can make a difference. We can just decide that we aren't gonna let the things of the past, which I think Governor Hochul said uh, uh, incredibly well, dictate the future. We are going to do something about it immediately. A million apprenticeships engaging both unions community colleges, and any number of private sector partners uh, creates that kind of immediate workforce that allows us to take, quite frankly, billions, it's hundreds of billions of dollars collectively into both the infrastructure we're gonna need for renewable energy jobs and for the innovations it's going to take to continue that effort across the country. So what is New Mexico doing? Well, I'm gonna tell you where we are and about my own executive order that we uh, uh, executed today, believe it or not, even though I'm in New York. So one, New Mexico ranks sixth in the US already for job growth in renewable energy jobs and we're number one in the country for energy efficiency job growth in America. And part of that is by making sure that we're providing rebates and incentives right at the marketplace so that consumers matched up with a growing uh, workforce can create the kinds of opportunities we're looking for. The executive order that I signed today, just in short, is we're committing to thousands of apprenticeships right now. And in our last legislative session, uh, January of this year, we actually committed millions of dollars and a trust fund to apprenticeships and work specifically in the space of renewable energy. New Mexico is home to North America's largest wind farm. Uh, we're about to eclipse that by building another one. That's before we talk about our solar footprint. And right now, New Mexico also leads the country that just, uh, not quite 45%, but closing in every day of all of our electricity is generated by renewable energy in the state of New Mexico, where we're seeing far too many states not even get to double digits. So in a two million strong state with the third best sun in the country and a lot of wind, fifth or sixth best for geothermal, and uh, we're also gonna really do incredible work with hydrogen because we also have what I like to refer as a, uh, an ocean underground. So brackish water reserves that allow us to engage in green, hydrogen uh, efforts statewide. So there's no wrong door for both these apprenticeships and job training. And I wanna just give you two more things that I think it can really lead to across the country, this powerful announcement today about what we can all do on the ground. You have these jobs, you have the training tools available, then you can move this agenda uh, nearly as fast, quite frankly, as we need to be moving. But look, New Mexico now has the most robust both uh, free college and apprenticeship training programs in the country, All right? So it's free. Two-year, four-year apprenticeships, trades, private sector, part-time, full-time, anywhere, anytime. Uh, we're gonna make sure that New Mexico sets the example for making sure that creating a workforce of the future is something that we're completely committed to, including in investing the things that working families and, and women uh, absolutely need, like universal free child care. So we're more than halfway there to funding universal free child care. We're leading the country in universal free uh, early childhood uh, pre-K education and we've got a moonshot investment in literacy and K through 12 so that you are committing to the long haul. This is the future work that is both incredibly meaningful, does so much better in the context of what your starting wages and career earnings can be. And in a state that's the second largest oil and gas producer, it says a whole lot about how fast you can transition into a clean, renewable energy workforce and situation in your state. Proving again that if New Mexico can do it, 
and we are, there isn't any place around the globe that can't do it. So I'm incredibly proud and honored to be the co-chair. I'm delighted to be participating directly in Climate Week, and I know this announcement is meaningful for every state in our nation. And a big thanks to the Biden-Harris administration, because without uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure, the bipartisan infrastructure law, it doesn't allow us to say and lead by example to other states, every state, you have the resources available to you to initiate and invest in all of it, soup to nuts. So let's get it done this week and every week. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Governor Luhan Gresham. All right, so the third governor of this alliance trifecta is someone who you all know really well by now. Someone who hired me for my first job at the age of 22, but more importantly, someone who had the vision and moxie to launch our coalition more than seven years ago. We are where we are today, and America's future is a hell of a lot brighter because of this leader. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Governor Inslee. Thanks, Casey. It's a joy to be with you and uh, my two fellow governors. Um, Listen, they've done a super job. Each one of their states, New Mexico and New York, are tied for second place as the best state <laughs> in the United States and in a very close second place in the clean energy transformation. Uh, uh, Casey, thanks for your leadership. It's incredible what you've been, been able to do with this organization. I really appreciate what you've done. Uh, my central message is how much I love uh, the Climate Alliance, and I want to share with you why that is. First off, I love being on teams. This is a team. And when you're, in, when you're working with people shoulder to shoulder and you're, you're moving the needle and you've you got a big challenge and you've got a team, there's not a lot better in life to be on a great team. This is a team of governors and states that are moving the needle in a way, in a way I'll talk about. Uh, but there's two reasons I really love this alliance. One is, one is kind of personal to me, and one is one that I think all of us can share. The part that's personal to me is that, you know, a quarter of a century ago, I, I had this, what I called a vision that others called a, a hallucination, <laughs> that we could build a clean energy economy in the United States and lead the world to a brighter future and help our families and our economy at the same time and give our children a chance to actually for a meaningful life on this beautiful and very unique planet. And that vision, you know, a quarter a century ago was, you know, kind of a challenging to a spouse. But I really believed it. And I, and I believed it because I thought America was very unique in its ability to, for entrepreneurs, together with a little bit of policy and some good leadership, could really change the world. And I'd seen this in my state in the first aerospace company and the first software company really succeeded. I'd seen it in my state. And I thought that that vision could, could really come to pass. So I introduced legislation, wrote a book, helped found the U.S. Climate Alliance. And that vision is now a reality. Verily, it has come to pass. Uh, I didn't make a single buck off this deal. <laughs> so I was a little disappointed in that part of it. But it's been very gratifying to see that this is actually now a reality. And what was a pipe dream a quarter of a century now is being realized in each one of our states. When you put a little policy together with brilliant entrepreneurs and really skilled people in layer, you can create a new economy. So from a personal thing, way, it, 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 I, I'm very vindicated by this. I feel good about it. But there's something we can all share. And that is the experience that I've had on so many different occasions in the last a couple of three years, maybe five or six years. And uh, just one story. I went to Zero Avia. Zero Avia is the company that had the very first hydrogen-powered commercial-sized airplane flight in world history. Took off from Grant County Airport in Moses Lake, Washington a couple of years ago. And I went up and was looking at their plant. This is a hydrogen-powered airplane. It's, it's an old Dash 8. Horizon flies them a lot. And met this young woman. And I, you know, I asked her what she's doing. And she says, well, I'm, I'm building hydrogen-powered airplanes. And I go, what part? And he says, well, I'm uh, going to become a manufacturing tech person. I said, what experience do you have? She said, well, I'm a high school graduate, and I want to build 
hydrogen power airplanes. And now this company has given me a chance through kind of an apprenticeship program to learn the skills to do that. And, and here's what was joyous to me. I asked her how she felt about it. And she had this smile that just went like from here to here. And just to see that, to see a young person who can see their dreams being realized in an apprenticeship program that's happening to change the world. There's just nothing more exciting about that. And all, all of you governors have had the same experience time three. And that has happened because of a great co uh, coalition. First, the U.S. Climate Alliance, and second, the federal government. I was at a company called, uh, uh, called Group 14. Group 14 is carbon or silicon, basically. They've developed a way to make a silicon nano battery. They're also now in Moses Lake, Washington. I went to saw the, the plant under construction. I remember looking at this iron worker. He was standing up. It's about a six-story building. They have the silicone go down through the manufacturing process. And he was standing with one foot on a girder that was still suspended by a cable. The thing swaying in the wind. And he had one foot on the superstructure. And this guy's putting together this building that's going to give us an additional 30% capacity and range of our electric vehicles. Think about that. And so when I talked to those guys, they just said, look, it's wonderful that we're gonna give the world a future, but I like this job. Because in Grant County, Washington, we used to grow sugar beets. And we took the sun and we turned it into sugar. Now we're taking the sun and turning it into electric vehicle, additional 30% range. And I wanna thank uh, all these 80 and President Biden and Vice President Harris for the, la the next $200 million they put in that company that happened two days ago. Thank them, please, for the, the work that they have done. So the Climate Alliance is moving the needle. Last year, we said we're gonna build 20, we're gonna put in 20 million heat pumps by 2030. Guess what? We are ahead of the pace to get that job done. This was last year, look what we're doing this year. We're gonna be ahead of the pace we're going to be ahead of the pace to get these apprenticeship programs. And I'm proud, frankly, we're on the right side of history. Now, alluding to New York, just for a moment, and don't take my comments as partisan, but there was a guy from New York who made his chops firing people, right? He thought the word apprentice was a vice. And he got really excited firing people. We think apprenticeships is a virtue we get joy in hiring people, and that's what we're gonna do across the U.S. Climate Alliance. And when we do this, and I may note, we're not just blowing smoke here, okay? The 24 stars on this flag, their economic performance has outpaced those stars that aren't quite yet, haven't got the memo. We're 60% of the U.S. economy, we've got a greater GDP and job growth than the other states that haven't quite got the memo, and we're going to help we build and hope that they will, will follow us. So I want to thank everybody involved in this effort. Let's keep this ball rolling. Good luck. Thank you so much, Governor Inslee. All right, and you're the tallest person by far, so I'm going to move this down. Um, uh, I started today's event by comparing the folks in this room to superheroes, and it's appropriate because it took a lot of heavy lifting to get here. It was the Biden-Harris administration, after all, that made this climate and clean energy boom possible, delivering the largest investment in climate action in history. And there has been no better partner in the White House than our next speaker. Please help me welcome National Climate Advisor, Ali Zaidi. It is just outstanding to be here uh, and really um, so much gratitude, Casey, to you. Uh, the Governor Inslee was talking about the incredible contributions of the Alliance. I think of the Alliance as where we go uh, when we stumble upon the hardest uh, problems. Uh, the stuff that's so difficult for us to sort out in Washington we turn to the Alliance and we figure out uh, a way forward uh, with a team that has proven time and time again that they can put points on the board. So I'm so grateful for your leadership, for your partnership, and for the capacity of the Alliance to deliver again and again, whether it comes to the industrial sector where we've teamed up, the building sector where we've teamed up, uh, and now in the essential task in delivering on 
climate progress, and that is training up the workforce we're going to need uh, to build the clean energy future. So round of applause for you. <laughs> Folks, these three governors, uh, and I liked Casey referred to them as a trifecta, trifectas deliver. Um, uh, these three governors, that's a Washington joke, uh, <laughs> um, but a nonpartisan one. Um, the, these three governors have really demonstrated, I think, the theory of the case, um, the new formula for climate action that the Biden-Harris administration has tried to carry forward in all 50 states. And the formula is pretty simple. Uh, rather than focus on loss, on sacrifice, on squeezing, um, let's focus on the opportunity, on growing, uh, on investing in our manufacturing and in our infrastructure, and investing in our middle class. And you see it uh, all across uh, the 50 states, but under these three governors' leadership uh, in their states in particular. Uh, Governor Inslee talked about Moses Lake. Uh, what they're doing there is incredible. But if you rewind uh, a decade ago, um, they were still reeling from uh, industrial decline. And it's a story that's so common uh, in factory towns all across the country, where trade policies passed and, frankly, a failure to invest in America uh, led to not only job loss, but a loss of a sense of community pride, uh, a sense of place, of purpose. And what we're bringing back in communities like Moses Lake all around the country, thanks to the blueprint forged in places like Washington State, is not only an investment in jobs, but in a sense of purpose, in a sense of pride. I was just in um, Dalton, Georgia, where uh, I... Um, met a bunch of folks who used to work in the carpet industry and in the flooring industry, uh, making sofas. Uh, now they're manufacturing solar, by the way, using wafer uh, that's being produced in Moses Lake. It's a good team sport, the solar industry. And um, one of the most remarkable things stuck with me uh, these last two weeks since I've been there is when you go through the entryway uh, of the factory in Dalton, Georgia, they have these pictures uh, that are drawn in crayon or color pencil uh, from the kids who uh, are the kids of the workers um, in, uh, in that facility. And if you look at them, to the last one, uh, it's these kids drawing what they see their parents doing. Uh, and it's not just forging a solar panel, uh, it's forging a future uh, that's better for them. Uh, one of the kids had drawn their parent as a superhero uh, that was saving the planet and manufacturing solar. And that's the sense of pride uh, I hope that we can bring uh, to every single person uh, who's involved in this absolute and profound transformation. I went to uh, uh, Belin, New Mexico uh, with the president uh, and uh, the governor was there, and you, you remember Solo Cups? Uh, they used to make them uh, at this factory. Now they're manufacturing wind turbines. Uh, absolutely profound transformation. A shuttered plant reopened now to meet the climate moment. Uh, and, you know, we talk so often about the impact on Main Street. Um, when I was uh, flying in with the president, I was Googling to see when would these jobs actually start to show up. The company had hosted a job fair on Main Street in Berlin the week uh, we showed up. Uh, these jobs aren't jobs in the future. They're jobs that are being created right now. They're being created right now. And if you look at the analysis, and this is so exciting, 250,000 energy jobs created last year under the Biden-Harris administration, clean energy jobs growing twice as fast, and perhaps the most exciting thing, at least from my perspective, clean energy jobs with twice the level of union density of the rest of the private sector. We are showing that we don't just need to create positions to be filled to manufacture and install the clean energy future. We are going to create careers that support a reinvigorated and a rebuilt American middle class. That's the promise of this moment. And 
Look, it's, it's fitting that we do this event in the House of Labor uh, and in New York, where, um, you know, folks have looked at the clean energy revolution take place across the country. And for a really long time, uh, to the chagrin of the manufacturing unions, uh, the building trades have been the tip of the spear in the transformation, right? So you've got uh, your laborers, uh, your electricians on the front lines of deploying this technology. Uh, technology, by the way, that was invented in the United States and for a really long time had not been manufactured in the United States. Not only are we bringing those manufacturing jobs back under the Biden-Harris administration, there are folks, including the people in this room, fighting to make sure those are good paying jobs. Here in New York, the steel workers teamed up with a company, Convault, to make sure solar manufacturing is union manufacturing. And for those who think union manufacturing is just for states that are in the North, uh, the UAW, also upstairs here, uh, has proved that you can build union batteries in Tennessee just as good as you can build union batteries in Ohio. F the reality is this, and I think we're seeing a, a consensus build around this, that union density and economic competitiveness fly together in the clean energy economy. That's absolutely the case, and today, Today we have a chance to turbocharge that transformation. It's interesting, the, Governor Hochul talked about um, uh, the AI revolution, and there's a lot of hand-wringing going on about whether we can produce enough energy to meet the AI revolution. Let me be clear, in the United States of America, we will produce enough clean energy to power AI, to power a manufacturing renaissance, to, pr to power the American climate comeback story that's playing out in manufacturing towns all across the country. We have the ability to do it, but here's an, here's an interesting thing. So we got all these AI CEOs around the table at the Roosevelt Room just a few weeks ago at the White House. And, you know, you'd think they raise their hand, they say transmission, and they did. And you think they raise their hand, they say permitting and siting, and they did. And you think they raised their hand, we have a conversation about chips, we did. But here was the loud consensus in the room. We need electricians, we need laborers, and we want to partner with the hundreds and hundreds of job centers around the country that are training these folks up. Today's announcement answers that call, whether it's for U.S. dominance in AI or it's for U.S. leadership on climate. The way we accomplish it is by leaning into the unions that have helped build the American middle class and built our competitiveness for decades. They are our ticket to winning the future, and that's what we're doing today. Not a million folks into apprenticeships by 2035, a million folks graduated from apprenticeships in 2035. That's what we're going to get done. So Governor Inslee, when he goes around the world, talks about the super nationals contribution to, to the climate conversation. That is the sub-nationals in the UN parlance. Uh, it's because these superheroes are showing up in a big way. One of the things that's hanging out here in New York is a conversation about the uh, durability of the climate transformation that we've seen in the United States. The scoreboard's pretty clear, right? We've got 100 gigawatts of clean energy, 25 million homes worth of energy that we've deployed uh, in just the last three and a half years, $900 billion of private capital investment. But where do we go from here? In the House Republicans have put up 50 votes to try to roll back parts of this agenda. They failed. But here's what I say to them. Look at these governors. Look at what's going on on the ground. The politics of climate inaction are ineffective and they are deteriorating. Those 50 votes failed. And 18 members of the House Republicans wrote to their own leadership saying, hey, let's quit. Let's give up on trying to roll this stuff back. And the reality is this. We've got the politics alloyed by the economics to 
produce the most durable transformation I think uh, we've ever seen in our economy. These governors get it. They have helped build the strength into this transformation, and it will be durable. We will keep charging forward, and we will accelerate because we are traveling not just to chase down greenhouse gas emissions. We're traveling to unlock an American dream where the middle class is rebuilt and America is on the frontier of manufacturing, innovating, and building the technologies we need to meet the moment. Thanks so much, Casey. All right, thank you so much, Ali. And before we close, we just want to say thank you all for being here. We know there's tons of competing events this week, and I really think you all made the best decision by being here this morning. Uh, thank you as well to our partner organizations, our supporters in the philanthropic community, and all of the officials here representing Alliance States. Um, we're going to ask a few of you to come forward in just a moment for a photo, but first we want to mark the moment with a photo of our speakers. So Governors Hochul, Lujan Grisham, and Inslee, and Ali Zaidi, please come on up again. If everyone else can please remain seated, I promise this will be quick.